I know it's nice to move into the bush, but as soon as we do, we've got to start clearing some of it. It's always tragic to do it. Whereas we should be buying large open areas that have been deforested and, and creating the bush that we'd like to live in, really. A lot of people are making money out of destroying wealth. And the, the present state of the world is that a lot of people have immune response problems, some very severe. There's a lot of uh, people with cancer are becoming very ill who are advised by their doctors to avoid artificial chemicals and foods and to eat nothing but organic products and they can't find them because there are no large organic markets, there is no funding for those systems, there's no advice available on them on the broad scale and banks generally will not lend for that sort of development. In fact, Largely, the banks are foreclosing on West Australian farmers unless they use pesticides and herbicides. So, in a sense, the banks force on farmers the use of superphosphate, whether the farmer wants to use it or not, and they also force the use of chemicals. And that's exactly the same for the seed companies. While we were setting up the permaculture system, about four companies, uh, ICI, Cibagaigi, um, IT&T, a couple of others, Shell Company, quietly took over the whole of the world's seed supply. There are only 20 plants produced in agriculture in any quantity and all of these plants are largely owned by one or other of those companies. In the United States if you buy a little fruit tree it has a tag on it that says if you take a bud or a cutting off this tree and sell it you'll be fined $800. So the basic foods of the society are owned by a few uh, oil companies, agrochemical companies, and there's a lot of madness on. See, what we've got is an agricultural system which is no longer making any pretense to feed people who can't get food. All it is doing is supplying a commodity market which doesn't allow the material to go out as food and almost all our wheat surplus is converted into methanol or in some other industrial base. And now we've got a methanol glut, and by public subsidy we have to buy all the storage systems for that, and they won't let the methanol go because it could replace petrol, and that would worry BHP and Shell. So we're really just funding our own constant impoverishment. At the same time as we're doing that, 18% of Australians go hungry to bed, and over 40,000 of our own kids don't have, uh, you know, a meal a day. And we can't get that food to those people because the market won't let us give it away. We dug in all our potatoes this year, 40,000 tonnes in Tasmania, and we couldn't give it to the people in society who don't have any damn food. And that's a lot of people in this society. It's 18% uh, of all of us don't have enough food. So that's a very strange system and it's just getting worse and worse. We're producing expensive, publicly subsidised surpluses of food and increasing the number of people without food and we're doing that month by month. What I'm saying here is we should attach those people to their own farms so they have direct food access. Farmers should start to produce the needs of our society and we should fund them to do it. And we should not route that money through governments because it's really funding the industrial sector uh, and the commodity market. It's making a lot of stock bakers rich trading wheat. Somebody uh, said of a load of wheat going to Africa recently, is that going to feed the poor? I said, don't be silly, that wheat's not for eating, it's for trading. We trade it over and then we trade it home again. And what we dumped on Africa was low-grade surplus, often dirty grains, that we couldn't get rid of in the pet food market and which had been too long in storage. I think some of you may have seen them opening bags on some of those programs and the bags be labelled wheat and what falls out is a gritty grey powder. It's probably sweepings from the flower room floor or something and people have been paid wheat prices for that com commodity broker. And all of you may have seen those trucks sold to help get the aid in and not one of those trucks would start. And uh, that's just that's how we're getting ripped off uh, and it's all of us getting ripped off so we're not really interested in that sort of rubbish. No other questions about anything? Yeah. What if you've got land that's still natural uh, that hasn't been cleared? Uh, land still in forest? 
Yeah, I think we should pay you to leave it in forest. Even if we've got to pay a hundred dollars a year to leave it in forest per acre. Uh, we really shouldn't be clearing land, and particularly West Australia, you have 0.87% of your forest left. Uh, well, what we should be doing is assessing what you have in that forest uh, uh, and and trialling it out because the total useful species in the North African desert are six. In the Thar Desert, 16. And in the South Australian deserts, you have 3,000 or more species of unknown use and the whole world needs them. And what we should be doing is is putting a small research group together and finding out just how much your species are worth if you collect the seeds and we can find a place for them in North Africa or India. And uh, if we go on clearing out the West Australian flora, uh, we're clearing out nearly all our future chance of reforesting dry areas, and it's specifically West Australian flora. I'm sure I could find a few Arabs who'd pay you lots of money to leave those trees in place and collect the seed from them. It's what we call a type one era, and uh, we should all be trying to buy and save that forest. We've set up trusts in New South Wales to buy rainforest to leave it there until we find out what we have. In Aboriginal settlement in which I am working, the most of them are drinking water at 1100 parts salt, uh, the bore quality is reported to the health department by the mines department and the health department has to approve the bore and they've approved all of those bores and we can only just grow vegetables in it, only just. And we've got 47% kidney failure in the Aboriginal population and they've approved bores up to 2300 parts salt and that means a death of all those people from kidney failure and that's the health department of the Northern Territory. And, and, and I can't often get a measure of the salt in the bores. I've got to take it and have it done. And I have sometimes requested it. So we're really treating the Aborigines as, as a separate item because we don't let our own people drink water over 700 parts salt. Tell us a little bit about the Aboriginal land rights type. Yeah, from the miners' people. Yeah. Well, you've got mining companies setting out now with big ads to wipe out <laughs> the Aborigines with all their land. About three to seven percent of Aboriginal people even live on country that was in any way Aboriginal. The rest don't, aren't making any land claims. They're your fringe dwellers and all your urban Aborigines. And really nothing good has happened to any of them. And already we're getting anti-Aboriginal before anything good's happened to them. And that's mainly through the mining companies. It's, it's really just just shameful. I think someday we're going to get an external commission come to Australia. For instance, of our Aboriginal children, 86% are grossly undernourished. Of all those, in their lifetime, all Aboriginal children will have had a chronic illness. Their life expectancy is falling because they've never been so sick in history. And in Alice Springs, 70% of them will be permanently deaf because of inner ear infection due to lack of vitamin C. And the, their ears have ruptured three times and the bones behind have rotted. And I've looked down these are terrascopes and all you see in here is just rot, both ears. And those kids will never hear. And all we're doing is sending out more teachers for a population which is going to grow up deaf and we're going to have them with us for 50 years, 60 years. And if we don't stop that, we're building a problem of shocking proportions. 70% of them are going to go permanently deaf. They're all going to go deaf for a long period of their lives. It's a chronic infection, has to be treated in hospital for nine months. The kids get behavioural problems because when they're little, they don't want to be away from their families for nine months. We can't cure the behavioural problems. We can't cure the deafness. It's incurable. And, and we just fail to supply even one orange or a vitamin C tablet to those kids and it's disgusting. The bottom line is, if you haven't got an orange into somebody's hand, you've done nothing, really. Anyhow, cheer up. We put in a couple of teaching gardens. We've got about 30 Aboriginal trained teachers. They've got horticultural certificates. They've got soil certificates. They're putting in home gardens at 10 a day in teams. And we're actually getting food into people's hands at a total cost of $8,000. And we've sold $40,000 worth of spare vegetables. A few people can cure it if you get the government out of the way.
All we want is the bloody government to get out of the way. I, I had a few of the mining companies to spend a little bit of money on nutrition instead of bashing people. It's shameful behaviour, you know. That's ethical business. If you go around Aboriginal households here, I don't think it'd be much different from Adelaide. Household size is very large, about 5.6 to 7 people, and about double hours per house. The income is extremely low. 46% of that income is spent on food, and none of, none of them say they can afford fruit. But most of that food is bulk carbohydrates for the kids. And uh, yet Aboriginal groups are also producing oranges out there past Waluna. But we don't have any food in these gardens here, and there's nobody whose job it is to match up production with want. I bet those guys of Waluna have been taught to send their food to some public market where it's eaten by people who don't really need. And most of it would be going to waste, about 80% of it would be going to waste. I was sitting in a car park chewing on a, a commercial pasty the other day, you know, sort of cursing my isolation. And uh, I heard some guy on a radio talkback program advising some poor rich to pour dildren around his Rose Arbor post. And he said he'd tried that, he'd done it double strength, and he'd done it, and he'd done it full strength. Uh, and would that be enough? And the guy said, yeah, that'll probably do the job. <laughs> uh, probably do the job for the whole of the water supply under this city too, which is already done to San Francisco's water supply. You can't pump from any bore uh, in the San Francisco region or in New Jersey or New Hampshire because they're all totally polluted with 86 organic chlorines from agriculture. And they're going to be there, they figure, for 400 years. So. I don't know if you've looked at your bores in West Australia, but with guys piling dealdren down around their posts and, and you know, your own radio station telling them to do it, I, I would bet you're in a, a, at least as bad a position as San Francisco. I bet your water table's loaded to the nine for this stuff. For example, what, are the best, what, what poisons are there in fruit and vegetables? Right. Well, you've got lots of use of dealdren. You've had the heaviest use of DDT anywhere in Australia, and I think it's still legal. You've got probably about another 80 chemicals being used on your farms and on your food, and I've seen producers dipping the food in the cases before it goes to market in the chemo, not spraying the trees, dipping the case quantities of food. And I say, would you eat that stuff? And I say, not on your deli, we wouldn't. And uh, I think Dennis McCarthy, who introduced me here, was working on a strawberry farm, Dennis, weren't you? Yeah, what did they put on? Something. DDT. They sprayed DDT on the day they sent the strawberries down to Perth and Dennis was driving the truck and they put it all on the pallets and that and he went down to the tip and tipped it. And then he went back and told the guy strawberry girl he just tipped all his strawberries off because he'd done an illegal thing. And it was illegal to, to for him to have done that. But listen, that guy is probably picking up those punnets and actually dipping them in DDT solution so they're not going to get insects on the way to market. And that is typical behaviour, that's not atypical behaviour. All your spuds are riddled with stuff. You guys don't even know what you're getting because before they act upon the test potatoes, they peel them. <laughs> that's true. Your, your ag department don't test unpeeled potatoes because they don't want to find out what's on the damn pill. They know what's on, they're recommending it, you know. What's on it, Dennis? Deal with something else and something else. There's three things on your spuds that I know about. There's probably ten. I only come over here every two or three years and the same old hair raising stories, you know. You're here about two days and you can find out practically anything you want to know. But I mean, people like, I mean, we're personally involved sometimes with growers. What's the stuff that apricots get round right in the middle? I don't know what the chemical is you spray for that. That's what they dip them in before they sell them to you. So you get them just nicely charged. They won't rot for months. Neither will you. <laughs> yeah, Dennis wants me to talk about common work, which is one of the strategies of land use, in which you take a farm and you imagine how it could be and you start to put it in place. It's owned by trust, not by any person and you let people come on and take up these things like growing the honey, growing the firewood and so on. And there's one running in England and the whole of the purchase capital and the investment capital into research that went into it was repaid in six years by the people on the farm. That is all the money that went into it, which was considerable. 
was repaid in six years by the endeavours on the farm and then they've got this huge extra capital because they're still going on putting 10% of gross into the common work fund. So the people who were, didn't own any land now own that farm and they've just bought a, a farm in Africa and they're all off to tell the Africans how to do it. And they say they'll get their money back in Africa in six years by teaching Africans how to farm for their own self-reliance and funding them to do it and they say that all their money will come back too. So, you know, it's only people on the ground, on farms, who have got a lot of common sense who are doing anything sensible. Governments don't seem to be capable of it. And I don't think governments are the way to run a country. They're in and out in three years. Whatever one does, the other one undoes. And, you know, they've got what they call soil conservation groups and departments. And year by year, our soil erosion problem increases every year. So what in the hell are we paying them for? Frankly, I think the way to run a country is to hire in a group of consultants to set 50-year flaming projects and get into the 50-year projects. We're not going to stop soil erosion with three-year governments or with soil conservation departments or agricultural departments. Since they've started work, the problem has worsened. And that's true of everything. Yeah, we've got problems with social welfare and we've got more people on welfare or more people hungry than before we had those departments. They don't grow no cabbages, you know. Those guys just eat. I'm a bit radical, aren't I? I get very angry, actually. What do you think long-term ecological and political consequences? Oh, total wind down. I mean, they're right in front of you, right? Increasing desert, more soil erosion. We've got 15% of our soils left in reasonable condition. That's all we've got left. You've got 0.07% of your forest left. You know, uh, your groundwater, you, you've got increasing use of pesticides, herbicides and, and biocides. You know, what do you think the future is? You've got more cars on the road, more acid rain, right? more unemployment. You just have a little guess for yourself. Just take it all forward. More people hungry every day. More homeless kids. And you're living in a good country. <laughs> What do you reckon the future is? No, I think we're whimpering out as fast as we can whimper. I think we've lost our guts and we haven't taken our own fate into our own hands and I think we're a lot of wimps. <laughs>